Okay, I believe we left off here. So receptors, in this case, small receptors in your nose, uh, carry the message along sensory nerves, which arrive at the CNS. Inside the CNS, intern neurons process the information, uh, recognizing what the smell is, deciding what to do about it, recognizing whether you enjoy it or dislike it, etc. Um, then there will be some autonomic, some automatic uh, functions that you don't deliberately decide, but your brain decides. In this case, if the lasagna smells good, it would um, tell your salivary glands to secrete saliva. Your mouth would water. And in that case, the effector is the salivary gland. All right, that's a motor autonomic nerve. Here is a motor somatic nerve. Remember, somatic is um, equivalent with voluntary. So a voluntary motor nerve would be traveling to the muscles of your arm and hand as you serve yourself lasagna because you've decided to get yourself a piece. These interneurons have processed the smell and decided to get a piece. So there's two neural pathways. One of them is here, and one of them is uh, here. I think I messed that up in the brain, but you get the basic idea. Um, notice that the effectors of this motor nerve are salivary glands and are involuntary. The effectors of this motor nerve are skeletal muscles, are muscles that you control. Um, so the important thing to look at here and to learn is an effector of a motor nerve. If it's a voluntary motor nerve, the effector is always a skeletal muscle. If it's an autonomic or involuntary motor nerve, the effectors, forget this business, you don't need to learn these two words, the effectors can be cardiac muscles, heart P, smooth muscles, for example, in your intestines and in your blood vessels and so on, um, and glands, endocrine and exocrine glands. Okay, mostly exocrine. All right. So that's important. You don't tell your glands to secrete. You don't tell your intestines to, to um, accelerate digestion. You don't tell your heart rate to speed up or slow down. But autonomic motor nerves do so. So that brings us to... Oh, okay. So what we just studied was a neural pathway, right? This is a neural pathway. And notice that I drew three interneurons here. Often there'll be many more. It's a very complex thing to recognize something, to remember it, to decide what to do about it. So neural pathways usually involve multiple interneurons as your brain processes information, figures out what it means, compares it to a memory of a similar situation, makes a decision about what to do, sends out a motor command telling your muscles to implement that, that uh, whatever you've decided to do, and so on. Uh, now we're gonna, so most neural pathways involve multiple interneurons, quite a few of them. This is a very, special and very simple motor pathway. It's called a reflex arc. You know what it is because you know what your reflexes are, right? A reflex arc is simply a neural pathway which does two things to speed up that neural message. It passes only through the spinal cord. It avoids the extra tip to the brain so that it saves time. And that's why there's no thought or decision in your reflexes. It would take too long if you said, oh, I'm being burned and you decided to, to lift your finger. Instead, it happens reflexively before you decide. And secondly, there's only one or possibly no interneuron in a reflex. So if you see in this diagram, the, um, the green nerve is the sensation. It arrives inside the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord. It's a cross section of it. There's one short little interneuron that connects this dangerously hot sensation to this motor command to move your hand. And immediately, the motor nerve here is sent to the effector of the arm muscle, which quickly removes your arm from the source of heat. So it's called a reflex because you don't decide and it needs to be quick. And the two things which make it quick are, does not go through the brain, only goes to the spinal cord and has a maximum of one interneuron. So this is a picture of the same thing. In this picture, I don't know if you can tell, but you should look carefully. This is supposed to be skin. So afferent or sensory nerve, and this is the efferent or motor nerve. And uh, if you look carefully, there's no interneuron here. So it's a reflex arc without an interneuron. And those do exist to save even more time. Um, this is yet another picture of a reflex arc. So I think you can read that and you'll understand it easily. Um, this is kind of interesting. It doesn't go through the brain. That's why you don't decide. And sometimes you don't even notice what you're doing until you've already done it with a reflex. All right. We're moving on to something called the autonomic nervous system. We're doing this very, very, very briefly, so you don't need to learn, learn the difference between the parasympathetic 
and the sympathetic. One is about stimulating, one is about suppressing. You just need to be able to recognize what these various organs are and that they're controlled by the autonomic or involuntary nervous system, right? Don't mix it up with automatic. It sounds like automatic, but it's slightly different. So these are on your worksheet. I think it's the bottom left of your back side of the worksheet. These are listed. So this represents, uh, do these pictures, the blue is a little bit more clear maybe. This represents an eye, pupil dilation or pupil constriction uh, is automatic. This is supposed to be a salivary gland, it's a funny looking salivary gland on your diagram, but you should recognize it because salivation is autonomic. Um, heart rate is controlled by the autonomic um, as well as breathing muscles and breathing rate. Um, so for digestion, it's the stomach and the intestines. The intestines are missing just for simplicity, but it's both. There's two aspects of it, and you should note this. Smooth muscle stimulation, right, for churning stomach and um, peristalsis of the intestines, as well as secretions, the many secretions of enzymes, um, gallbladder secretions. This is a urinary, because there is a part of urination which is voluntary, but there's also a part which is involuntary. Imagine if the whole time you had to hold back from going to the bathroom, you had to explicitly concentrate on holding back. You don't. There's a part that's uh, involuntary and uh, sexual excitation or some stimulation. Okay, another picture of the same thing. Autonomic nervous system. Just be able to list them, list them all on your worksheet. Um, so a quick comment. This, since the autonomic nervous system controls all these things, even though they're involuntary, there's still sensory nerves giving them the information. There's still sensory nerves, for example, in your stomach saying, oh, the stomach is stretching out. You better um, stimulate digestion. And so there's a sensory nerve in the stomach telling your brain, the stomach is stretching, it's full of food, and so on. Um, here's an example of one such sensory nerve that we're very unaware of. These nerves um, sense the blood pressure in your big blood, in your large blood vessels, and um, Tell your brain that so that your brain can respond in certain ways. So, uh, okay, we're going to skip all this. We're going to skip this a little bit more specificity than we need. Just as a quick review, this is spinal cord. These are sensory nerves from your skin, from your stomach, telling you you feel full. And these are motor nerves, um, voluntary or somatic motor nerves to the skeletal muscle. And uh, involuntary or autonomic going to your cardiac muscle, going to your smooth muscles, bladder, intestines, and blood vessels. Um, and there should be a third one, it's probably out of the picture, going to your glands, because autonomic also uh, give commands to your glands. Salivary glands, sweat glands, digestive juice glands, etc., etc. Okay. So we are moving on to, uh, this is an interesting point. Notice that since the nerve cell is very, very long, it's full of something we learned about at the beginning of the year, um, microtubules, these structure, these protein filaments, and protein fibers give it structure um, inside the cell. It's got a big cytoskeleton, basically. Um, the myelin sheath, these bumpy yellow things that uh, we didn't identify earlier when we were learning about the nerve are a, um, it basically, sheath means the uh, outer covering of a sword. They're kind of like the outer covering of a, nerve, of a nerve's axon. And they're really important because they accelerate the speed of the nerve impulse. And they also protect the nerve from being damaged. Um, and the reason I bring it up, two reasons. We're not going to study them a lot. This is what they look like. They actually consist of cells that are wrapped all around the nerve cell. Um, and they're called myelin. They're made of myelin. And they're kind of like a wrapping of the nerve cell. But the reason that I bring them up, we're not going to study these in detail, is two things. First of all, a newborn's uh, primitive nervous system is very largely due to the lack of myelin on their nerve cells. So a newborn is growing these myelin coverings, and that's how their nerves begin to work better. And that growth of that myelinization, it's called of nerves, continues through age 25. So it's also part of the development of children and adolescents. Secondly, it's, uh, there's a number of famous degenerative diseases, multiple sclerosis being the most famous, which deal with damage to the myelin sheath. And you can see how this very damaged myelin sheath um, 
is what causes the, the serious demobilization of people who have multiple sclerosis. Um, okay. It's an autoimmune disease. Your immune cells accidentally attack your own myelin sheets. All right, um, here we go. This is a new topic. This is about the nerve potential. So the first thing you need to know about the nerve cell, this here is the nerve cell. This is the axon. This is a close-up of the axon. It's being made very geometrically perfect and precise. There is what there's a potential difference. There's an electrical voltage difference on the outside and the inside of the cell. The inside of the cell is slightly negatively charged. The outside of the cell is slightly positively charged. You don't need to know this term. It's called the resting potential. But it's a potential difference or a difference in charge across the cell membrane. We're not going to study this in detail. We're just doing a summary, which is this slide and the next slide. So what happens? A cell has this difference in charge across its cell membrane, a positive side and a negative side. A nerve impulse, right, the famous electrochemical impulse, which carries the message on nerves, is simply a change of this charge, a reversal of this charge that travels along the nerve's axon. So if you look, what happened? Here is the resting potential when your nerve is at rest. Here's the beginning of a message being sent. Look what happened to the charges. They were reserved, reversed. The positive charge goes inside. And that, that nerve impulse has gone a little bit further. It's going here, now it's going here. The blue part is here. And it keeps traveling along the axon. It's traveled down, it's gonna next go here. And all it brings with it is a reversal of charge, positive and negative charge. How does it happen? How would the charge be reversed? Through, I don't know if you can see it, this diagram shows Na pluses, sodium ions, K pluses, potassium ions, and some other ions are involved also, but mostly through these ions traveling in and out of the cell through channel proteins, oops, and carrier proteins. I should have said carrier proteins. Um, these are This is the famous sodium-potassium pump. So now you know one of the many reasons why ions in your body, which are electrolytes in your body, which seem like such an unimportant thing to us, really are hugely important. So um, proper electrolyte distribution is absolutely essential for uh, the, the, for nerves to transmit their messages. Um, so again, you can see that there's a K plus and Na plus. There's the movement of ions across the cell membrane that makes the nerve impulse travel. Okay, we're done with that. This is the long version of it, which we're not studying this year. It's very detailed and complex, so you can be relieved about that. See how detailed it is. This is some review slides I had made. Okay, here we go. This is our new topic. Um, sorry, I thought I had arrived. I had At the very end of a nerve cell, here, look at this nerve cell. So these are the dendrites. The direction of the nerve impulse is this way, or this way, and then this way. Here's the axon, and here are the nerve endings, or the axon terminals. These axon terminals, if you see, they have little bumps. I call them frog toes, because I think they bump out like tree frogs have little bumps at the end of their toes and fingers. And we're going to be zooming in on these frog toes. So this picture is a zoom in. See that bump there? That's a frog toe. What is it? It's the very end of an axon. It's an axon terminal or nerve ending. Between that axon terminal and the next cell, the cell to which it's transmitting the message, there's a gap. It's also called a cleft. The synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft. Okay, there's this gap. And the question is, a nerve electrochemical impulse, it's like a wire. It needs a continuous connection. That's why nerves are long and thin. There's this anatomical connection that acts like a wire carrying the message. But now when there's a space, that doesn't work. It's a no-go. It's like a wire that's been broken. Your electrical appliance won't run. It won't work if the wire has been broken. So what occurs? What occurs is called synaptic transmission. Um, okay, before we do that, here's a little connection. This is a nerve cell connecting to another nerve cell. This would be, for example, in your brain. Nerve cell connecting to a muscle would be a motor nerve, a nerve cell connecting to a gland, telling it to secrete. So this would be um, motor voluntary, motor involuntary, or autonomic. And here it is close up, this frog toes touching the muscle. What is it that happens? So what happens in synaptic transmission is there are vesicles full of a very important chemical. The chemical is these orange blobs here called neurotransmitter. When the message arrives, tells the synaptic vesicles to secrete uh, out into the synaptic cleft, out into the open space. And they get secreted into 